I'm going to do something a little unkind. I'm going to cut a little bit into our speaker's time because it's so important that I introduce you to a fellow that I love and admire. Uh, one of, I think, the most faithful Christian servants of the city uh, in our country. And I want to do it by telling a very brief story. In 1994, a very prominent urban developer had a $3 billion fund for helping in the cities. And he invited me to come down and run a program in Baltimore in the Sandtown, Winchester area where he said he was going to use his resources to address every system in the city. Schools, housing, community policing, health care. He was going to address everything for this community of 10,000 people. I felt called by God instead to serve in youth ministry in a congregational church and I turned it down. But that program, for all the good it did, for all the good intentions, and it did a lot of good, ultimately did not succeed. God had, however, another plan. God was inspiring a youth minister in a Severna Park church and one of the members of that youth group, a high school student, to engage the theology of John Perkins, a theologian from Mississippi whose theology of racial reconciliation would stop with the big grant, stop telling us what to do, stop coming with the five-point plan. You want to change the city? Move in. That's it. Move in. Pray, live with, move in. The pastor, the youth pastor said, I'm going to do this. And the young man in his youth group said, yeah, let's do this. After he got out of college, they planned, they prayed, they were called to the same neighborhood, Sandtown, Winchester in Baltimore. Alan Tibbles and Mark Gornick went there. Just before they went, Alan was the youth minister. He was playing basketball with the kids. He tripped, he ran into the wall, and he broke his neck. His thoughts as he lay there were, God, you just made this interesting. They moved in, Alan with his family, Mark Gornick, who is one of today's presenters. They moved in, and they had nothing. But they played a little basketball, and they bought ice cream, and they prayed with folks, and they had a little prayer group, and they had got it up to like seven folks, an 80-year-old woman, a 12-year-old boy. And in their little brownstone, they got out some sheets of paper one night and said, let's, let's see, ask what God's vision for our community is. And they got out crayons, and they drew refurbished homes, and parks, and a job center, and a new school, and a church, and a choir. And then over 25 years, they just did it. Eight square blocks, how many blocks, Mark? Twelve square blocks, over 300 beautiful brownstones, completely renovated. A model $5 million demonstration charter school founded by, funded by the Annie Casey Foundation. Uh, Johns Hopkins and then Mercer Hospital, health care, job center, New Song Church, a children's choir that traveled around the world, an amazing God-driven inspiration and project. And at the end of 25 years, Mark said, I feel called to go to Harlem. And he went to Harlem, but God put a different claim on his life. The claim he put on his life, life was Christianity is so vibrant in New York, particularly with populations where it's vibrant where they come from, from the global south and from Asia, from South America. Someone needs to help equip the pastors of these churches who are preaching the gospel, living the gospel, working a full-time job somewhere else, did not go to Yale Divinity School, are not going to Yale Divinity School or Union or General, and he created SETI Seminary. SETI Seminary is this extraordinary place of training and equipping pastors who are already working as pastors. They gather together in these classes of 12 that stay together throughout their three years. It's a phenomenal institution. I hope you'll make Mark and Janice and Maria answer questions about it because what they're doing is truly extraordinary and it's a blessing for them to be with us today. By short word of introduction, Mark has also written The Word Made Global Stories of African Christianity in New York, which won the Missions Global Affairs Book of the Year Award from Christianity Today and was an International Bulletin of Missionary Research Outstanding Book of 2011. He wrote a book about his experience in Sandtown, Winchester. Both these books are available, To Live in Peace, Biblical Faith, and the, co and the Changing of the City. He is the co-editor of Understanding World Christianity, the Vision and Work of Andrew F. Walls. And with Yale's Nicholas Walterstorff, he's written Hearing the Call, Liturgy, Justice, Church, and the World. He's joined today by Janice A. McLean Farrell, who has her PhD from the University of Edinburgh and is a professor at City Seminary. Janice's work focuses on Jamaican Pentecostalism in the city 
in New York and in London. She is the co-editor of Understanding World Christianity, the Vision and Work of Andrew F. Walls, and the author of many articles on immigrant churches and urban youth and religion. And Maria Liu Wong has her PhD in education from Teachers College, Columbia. She is the Dean of the City Seminary of New York. She's been an educator for over 16 years. Her work focuses on women and leadership, adult learning, and urban theological education, urban immigrant youth, and diversity. Her most recently published article is Christ in the Capital of the World, How Global Christians Are Revitalizing New York City Far Beyond Manhattan. What an extraordinary gift to us for them to make the trek up here from New York City, the first of what I hope will be many visits as we partner together. I'd like to introduce my friends from City Seminary. Won't you welcome them? Good morning. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to take turns, and we will... Um, I'm just going to bring you quickly through the morning. Um, as an overview, we will um, have a little bit of welcome and introductions. And then I will start by telling you um, a little bit about a story of OCM, which is called Overseas Chinese Mission, which is um, one of the largest Chinese churches in Manhattan and in New York. And a little bit about my story. Um, and then Mark will come up and he will talk a little bit about the global city and the next generation and share with you a little bit about our research with the Next Generation Project and also the Youth Ministry Fellows Program. And then we're going to invite you to respond. Um, on your tables there are um, papers with circles and we'll explain what those mean. Um, and then we'll have a break. And then um, Janice will come up and share about um, the second generation in the Jamaican context in New York. And then Mark will wrap up a little bit, and then we'll ask you again to respond, um, but this time in groups. And this will require you to get out of your seats and do some moving. So then we'll have a break and then question and answer. Um, but before I continue, I want to thank Skip and Allison and everyone who um, was behind organizing this event, and also all of you who came here this morning, um, and we're really, and the live stream folks. Um, and we are really grateful to have the opportunity to share a little bit about our story and um, what we're seeing happening in New York. Um, I think part of our job is really to listen first and to see, um, and that really forms what we do. So it's really just um, learning and seeing, observing what God is doing in the city and responding to that. Um, so, as a bit of trying to understand who's in the room, um, could you just raise your hand if you are a parent? Okay, great. Uh, youth leader or pastor? Okay. Um, who was raised in a Christian home? Okay. Who's from an immigrant family? So your parents were born outside of the United States. And who lives in a city? Okay. Great, that really helps us to frame how we're gonna go about our um, morning. Um, so now I'm gonna introduce a little bit about City Seminary um, in terms of our vision. So um, Skip gave us an introduction yeah, um, that we started about 10 years ago and it started with Mark in a barred um, basement room um, and really trying to think about, well, how do we respond to the needs of what's going on in the city? Um, there are people who are pastoring, people who are working, and how do we bring them together to equip them further, um, to provide theological education for people who cannot relocate their families and their jobs to go somewhere for three years to have seminary, but to be equipped while they're in ministry? Um, and how could we bring together people who don't normally cross paths? Um, and so over 10 years, we've formed this community of, of leaders um, who are called to be in the city, to serve in the city, um, to live and work in the city, and to seek the peace of their neighborhoods and their communities. And um, our call has been to bring these different people together, because often in diverse or disparate communities, the issues are often more common than different. Um, and it's been a sp about creating a space for people to have conversation and dialogue that they might not have in their particular church context, but they can um, come around a table and have conversations about how are you dealing with this particular issue or that particular issue. Um, 
And it's about uh, not necessarily having a top-down approach, but doing theology on the ground and um, thinking about how do we equip this next generation and this current generation for work in the city as they're doing it. So I'm just going to draw your attention to a picture. This is earlier in our uh, life. Um, and this is one of our Pray and Break Bread events where we go every year to five to seven different neighborhoods in every bar in New York. And um, we think about theology on the ground. It's about getting to know a neighborhood, hearing what's going on in the neighborhood, and then walking through and praying for, touching a school, a hospital, speaking to somebody and asking them what's going on and how can I pray for you? How can I pray with you? And it's also about bringing our families along um, so that we're all praying for the city. Because you can't pray for a city if you don't know anything about it. And if anybody's been to New York City from neighborhood to neighborhood, you know you can go two blocks and it looks totally different. And often New Yorkers, they know where they live, they know where they work and where they play, but who goes to Staten Island? Who goes to the Bronx unless you have a reason? So we make a reason. We make a reason to say that as a community, we're committed to praying for the city, but we can't do it unless we know the neighborhoods and we know people in the neighborhoods. So that when I think about White Plains Road, I'm thinking about all of the nail uh, salons and the, and the, the barber shops and thinking about you know, who is going and walking down that street and, and living in that neighborhood. Or I'm thinking about Bro Brooklyn and counting all the churches, because Brooklyn is the borough of churches. You go and you can find like three, four, five churches you know, in a, on a couple blocks. So, and ha praying for those churches and what they're doing together, because often they're not always doing things together. So this is who we are. Um, and something that's come out of this um, kind of organic process has been the Next Generation Project, which is trying to understand faith transmission and translation. So where we're coming from and where we're going. Um, and this is in two ways, um, with the Youth Ministry Fellows Program. We have a Ministry Fellows Program which is for adults, but we found that coming out of that, the, the people who are youth leaders in the Ministry Fellows Program, they were saying, we'd really love for this to, to happen for our youth, so for high school kids. We started um, a pilot last summer and we're continuing this year um, to create that kind of, the same kind of space for youth leaders from different churches and kids from different churches to see that, you know, what, what is Christianity outside of my church? that before they even get to college or to wherever beyond, that they can start having these really serious conversations about, oh, I, I didn't realize that God is worshipped in so many different ways and so many different traditions. And it's not about who's right or wrong, but who is part of the body of Christ and how we complete the body of Christ by understanding all the different ways that God created us to be diverse in our traditions and in our cultures and our languages. And out the, ministry fellows program, the Youth Ministry Fellows Program is coming out of the next generation research that we've been doing for um, a few years to really more systematically look at different churches and sit down with parents, sit down with youth leaders, sit down with youth and ask them what's going on, what's happening in your churches. And Mark is going to go uh, into that in greater detail. Um, but I just want to frame our, our time with a verse from Deuteronomy um, 4.9. But take care and watch yourself closely, so as neither to forget the things that your eyes have seen, nor to let them slip from your mind all the days of your life. Make them known to your children and to your children's children. So this is about families and communities passing on their faith to the next generation. And understanding that it might look differently um, in the next um, adaptation because the world changes and the context changes. But it's holding on to something that is really the thing that, that binds the community together. It's a faith in Christ and the gospel and the good news. Um, and again, Mark will probably say a little bit more, but I want to get into my section. So I'm going to start with a little video clip. Um, it's of a, um, this is kind of a history documentary, but I'm just showing you the trailer. Um, of Overseas Chinese Mission, which is a church in Chinatown, where actually I grew up in, um, from first grade through 12th grade. And it has made a significant impact in the community. And this is just to give you an illustration of the, the role of a church in a community. And not just in the local Chinatown community, but you'll hear about the virtual Chinatown, the Chinese immigrants that come to New York City. So I grew up actually in Long Island, 
but one seventh of my life every single weekend was in Chinatown. So I was kind of going back and forth between the suburbs and Chinatown. So I'm just gonna let you, um, oh, and this is a picture of my family. That's my husband on the left, my three kids, my parents, and my sister. And um, we're three generations of the Lu's and Wong's, and my parents are missionaries um, to the overseas Chinese, and um, my kids will hopefully carry the family tradition. Um, and I came to this place not wanting to carry my family's tradition, doing everything to not be like my parents, and God had a different plan for me. So let me just show you this video. We had to barricade ourselves against the Italians because it was like very, very hostile neighborhood to us. This was their place. There was no Chinese signs. This was not Chinatown. The Chinese wouldn't even walk across Canal Street. Tough, you know, because we like we have a lot of immigrants that time. We have to have faith. This is what God wants us to do. We're going to do it. Okay, so that clip kind of gives you a picture of what I'm talking about. It's easier for me to show you that than to try to explain it to you. Um, so this is in Chinatown, and this story of overseas Chinese missions starts in the 1960s. The Chinese were here for many years before that, but with the Chinese Exclusion Act, immigration went all the way down, and with 1965, the Chinese were actually able to come back. And with that, immigration started to rise, and it has continued to rise, and um, with that, there's this family, um, Pastor Xi and his family who came from Singapore, who had a vision for planting a church in Chinatown. Um, so they came, and they became part of an existing church, and then they decided, you know, we want to do something um, here we were sent to, and then they, they started a church of 20 people, which grew, and then it moved to East Broadway, and then it grew, and so they had to make a decision about what are we gonna do next. So back in the day, it was you know, pretty much, um, South of Canal was Chinatown, and then there, was, um, there were Italian immigrants, there were Irish immigrants, and you know, they were kind of in these kind of ghettos of 
different you know, language or cultural populations. And they made a decision to move north of Canal, and the documentary goes kind of through the history. Um, and by making that decision to go into this new neighborhood, they stretched the boundaries of Chinatown, and they created a whole new um, way of existing as a church with the community. Um, they bought this building by faith. It was a $1 million building that went down to 600000 that went down to 400000 and they pledged international students, garment factory workers, restaurant workers, they pledged, they only had 20000 but they somehow made it to the $100,000 down payment, and they bought that building. And it was a building that they had to fix on their own. Um, eventually, they, there was a church in Lancaster, Pennsylvania that um, donated pews, and so they finally had pews for their sanctuary. And they made apartments, so people moved in. The pastor lived there, people from the neighborhood lived there. They had a gym on the second floor, so it became a part of the community. And that's how they became church. And it was a home base for many of the Chinese who were now bringing their families and, and, and such. And, um, and so that was the 1960s, um, and it, it's, it's a non-denominational church, um, and, um, and it started doing ESL and youth groups, and then my family, I, I enter the picture in the 1980s, when my parents came from England. My parents were originally from Hong Kong and then had moved to England, and then we moved over to New York because my parents were, had a heart to serve the overseas Chinese. So although we lived in Long Island, my, my dad was a, an engineer by day, missionary by night. Um, they, we had a studio in our basement, and they um, produced cassette tapes back in the 80s in ten, 10 different dialects for different Chinese populations with evangelistic, music, all the, that kind of thing. And we made the trek every week to Chinatown. And that is how I grew up, kind of being in two worlds. Um, but OCM mixed both the physical Chinatown and the virtual Chinatowns, because there were a lot of other people in Connecticut and in New Jersey and in Long Island that moved and came into Chinatown um, every Sunday. It was a social place, a cultural place where you could get good food and you could see um, other people and worship in a language and in a, in a cultural environment where it was felt like home. So OCM was a place that was very marked by the Chinese culture, um, the older brother and older sister kind of feeling of peer leaders in the fellowship. Um, and that sometimes led to intergenerational tensions because culture run, ran the church. Um, and I think growing up, I had to try to figure out the difference between what's cultural what's culture and Christianity and how does that all make, make sense. But what was interesting was, was in the 80s, it was a lot of gang violence. Um, and my husband, who grew up in Chinatown, um, and I met there, um, we met in high school, um, and it was a place where youth actually came um, because there was, it was a safe place. There was a summer day camp, there was an after school program. And what the, um, the, the church pastors did, which was interesting, was they brought in um, a white guy from Iowa and his, his wife and his um, family who had a heart for China but ended up in Chinatown. Um, and they moved into the building, and Rick and Deb were our role models um, because our parents were trying to figure out how to transcend these cultural boundaries um, and the language. So not saying that bringing a white guy to every Chinese church, but it worked for our church. Um, and it was a place where um, I think I grew up, and my, my husband, he came later on, but he actually went to a different church for after-school program because his parents didn't want him to get into the gangs, so they sent him to the after-school program and then eventually came over. But, I mean, you see where the church was playing a role in this very influx community. Um, and it was there that I was formed in fellowship with other kids who looked like me. Um, and we were all kind of going through that awkward, like, do you speak Chinese that well? I mean, we learned how to order food. And even now, I mean, we get made fun of by our parents to the capacity of our ability to speak in Chinese to our grandparents. Um, but this is our time to grow up together. And it was our time to make sense of the world together. Um, but it was also a, t a place to be and a home base. And um, I'm going to make this a little shorter, but I wanted to um, say that, and it was in this place and in this moment in the season that my parents um, charged me with 1 Timothy 4, 12 to 16. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity, and so on. 
Um, and this charge, I think, was a very real thing, saying that it doesn't matter if you're young, you can still be out there doing things and serving wherever you are. And this was the message, I think, for the youth um, in our youth groups, even just from the peer leaders who are a little bit above us. For some reason, there are a significant um, uh, number of us now in my, um, I'm in my 30s now, um, who have gone on to seminary, who have gone on to become pastors. For some reason, that was a very formative ex period for us, and even for the generation a little bit older than us. Um, and there have been two groups, those who stayed in the Chinese church and those who moved on. And for me, I've been one of those who's moved on, so to speak, but it doesn't mean that I don't have my connection with the Chinese church, but I think my calling was different to be a bridge builder, to be serving in other communities that were not limited to my ethnicity. Um, and I firmly believe there's a, there's a place for both of those things, both of those roles. And it's really important to have the communication going between those who come back and serve and those who move on. Um, so let me just leave you to, um, with my, um, my reflection on the legacy of that time, the faith of this family that pushed to make church part of the community, and the hope that was built and the seeds that were planted in our generation in the 80s, in spite of all of the stuff that was going on. Um, the legacy of this church is now in us parenting our youth. Um, and us asking the questions, what's the role of church? What's the role of family, community, and seminary? And we're building on the shoulders of our parents and our aunties and our uncles who watched out for us. And all those grandmas who were in the basement of that nine-story building who were praying every Sunday for all the kids who were upstairs. Um, so this is a story about a community, a family that became an extended community that prayed for all the kids and all the people in the community in order for us now, we are bearing fruit from the seeds of their faith. Um, and as part of this Next Generation project, I'll be working with actually three other women who were my prayer partners in high school um, during that time to write a collaborative autoethnography to trace back what were, the, what were the things that happened in our lives. And we come from different families, um, different kinds of Chinese. One woman is Wenzhou, another one is, I'm also from Hong Kong, another one is uh, Vietnamese Chinese. Um, but we all were it, there in that season and trying to understand and unpack what, were, what was happening during that time that enabled us now, 20 years later, though we all go to four different churches, we're all in leadership, we all are strong in our faith, and what was it that helped us to stick with it, I guess? Uh, I think sticky faith is one of those words that is um, in the youth ministry world. Um, and for us, it's not just how did we come to this place, but now how do we parent our children who are now in, a, again, a new context where we're now, I guess, 1.5, second generation. How do we parent our third generation kids um, to try to understand what their faith looks like now, moving on? So my story is just a way to kind of open up kind of the more um, scholarly um, way of, of thinking about um, what we're doing. But I want to leave you just with an image of, of, a, of a bridge. This is, I'm sure, if you have kids or boys or girls, you recognize this from a train set. Um, I mean, I find that objects help me to ground um, and remember who I am. And this is what God has called me to be a bridge, to bring together um, people and places and things that not, don't normally cross paths, but at City Seminary, we have had, um, and we are having an opportunity to do that. So I feel like the story that started at OCM is now living through me and being a part of the seminary, and um, it's, it's a call and a charge um, to continue that legacy. So I'm gonna now give the time to Mark. So thank you, Maria, and thank you again, Skip and Allison and everyone here for having us. So uh, one of the things I found when I moved to New York City was this, um, perhaps unexpectedly given what people often think about New York, is an extraordinary um, uh, ground up uh, religious uh, uh, renewal and vibrancy in the city. And when we started the seminary uh, and about 10 years ago, I had 
I had uh, in this class of students a number of students from OCM, the church that Maria is from, and she wasn't actually, her and her husband came in the second class. And I had this group of students, four, four or five students in the early years of the seminary who were from OCM, and they, and they brought um, uh, extraordinary passion for Christ and for the city. And I have wondered from those earliest days, how did that happen? How did this, this new immigrant church um, in Chinatown, uh, how, did they, how did they generate such leadership for the city? And so it's that kind of looking at what's going on in the city and, and working, working your way back. You're seeing what God is doing and then trying to, to sort out how that happened, what were the ways that that came together. Um, in this conference is on urban ministry. And one of the things we think a lot about is what is your context of urban ministry? Because not every city is the same. I pastored in Baltimore for a long time, and, and that is different than New York City. So like any good real estate people, you know that the most important thing is location, location, location. Well, that's really even true for urban ministry. And so just to say a little bit, because not everyone comes in the same context, even though what's happening in New York is very influential or very much a precursor to things going on around the United States. But a global city is a city that experiences multiple migrations. Um, people have always come to New York from around the world, but as Maria noted, since 1965, people are coming from other parts of the world. And so New York City has experienced extraordinary growth from uh, Africa, Asia, and Latin America in the last 30 years. Um, at the same time, people don't just come to New York and stay, uh, and stay unconnected. They remain connected to their home churches, to their home, uh, to their families. So people are linked not by as much spatial relationships, but by networks. And so New York City and their church communities become nodes of, of involvement. And then there are also places of encounter, zones. Cities are places where multiple networks, global city like New York, people from around the world encounter each other, like Maria described in Chinatown, where um, uh, Italians and the Irish and uh, Chinese were in the same area, and they had to encounter, and they had to find a way to relate to each other. And then this all brings us to the sort of the idea that globalization, which we think about often as a very top-down economic process, from my experience, as I experience a city, um, it's also about religious faith from the ground up and through these networks. And this has really brought extraordinary change to New York City. There's a phrase sometimes called world Christianity. And world Christianity means that Christianity is not just from the West, but it's from around the world. And that around the worldness of the Christian faith has really found a home in New York City. Um, um, in the last 20 to 30 years now, we can look at New York and we can see that more than half the population of New York is either foreign born or the children of foreign born parents. And this change in New York City has also changed the religious life as migrations have come. And so today there are now more than 2,000, probably upwards of 3,000 new congregations in New York in the last 25, 30 or so years, maybe a little bit longer, that are led, have been led and founded by uh, people from Africa, Asia, and Latin America. And so what we think of as church in New York represents a world of Christianity. And there's this extraordinary diversity. In fact, um, it is estimated, and this is not just our statistic at the seminary, but we read this in the Times, so it must be true, right? But one in 10 New Yorkers is a Pentecostal Christian. One in 10 New Yorkers is a Pentecostal Christian. Um, even if it's one in 15 or one in 20, that's extraordinary. Um, that's a change that's happened because of migration. Uh, but what we found is that as we're experiencing this, this change and what we're observing, that um, all the, much of the attention has not gone on urban youth and youth in these new migrations. But in fact, our experience is that youth are the center and the, and the leading edge of Christian faith in New York City. So we really as a seminary want to understand what is happening in the city. And so, as Marie explained, the Next Generation Project has two sort of um, uh, ways we're living it out. And one is the uh, Youth Ministry Fellows, which is a version of our full seminary program for young people. And that involves 
uh, coming together and, and learning in a group, crossing uh, diversity, um, thinking about calling and vocation, uh, building bridges to Christian communities you may not have the same experience with, um, and gaining hands-on ministry experience and helping young people continue to think about how God is at work in their community and their life. And here are just some of our students from last year um, in East New York and Brooklyn. And we have really nice t-shirts at City Seminary. <laughs> um, here they are. So the other aspect is sort of is our research. And our understanding of research is it's extremely relational. That is, if I want to understand how so many Christians uh, be, became leaders out of Maria's church, one way to do that is to sit down and listen to Maria's story and to sit down and listen to Tack's story or Eric's story or um, any of the stories of uh, the families that we've talked about and just to listen to them. And so what we're really interested in is understanding is how, what happens to religious faith, the practice and beliefs as generations, across generations and across geographical difference. So we're looking at the continuities and the differences and the changes in belief and practices. And we are really seeking to learn from the next generation, to listen to young people, to listen to the leaders. Uh, we don't really come with answers on what youth ministry is. In fact, I think what you're going to hear from the, the overall impact of our presentation is that we're seeing different things. And we're presenting a global city that has different expressions of Christian faith and of urban youth ministry. And so we're trying to understand the transmission of faith and how it's translated or adapted as it passes through generations and changes contexts. We're trying to understand that as a seminary um, and support it and learn from it and make it central to who we are as a learning community. Now, in, uh, in the city, youth face a number of uh, challenges. And they're getting belonging is a central matter. Who do we belong to? Who are we? What's... What's our identity? And in a global city with multiple migrations and connections, um, um, young people face a, uh, the pull of a lot of different directions. And they have to, they have to live in a multiple spaces or, or locations. They have to learn to live in two or more cities. So for example, if you're from Ghana, you're from Accra, Ghana, you may have come later. Your parents may have brought you to New York City a few years later. And then during the summer, you may be going home back to Accra and then living in New York City, in the Bronx, for example. So you have to learn to live in two cities, and you have to think about your identity in multiple ways, how people think of you, how you think of yourself. The other place, the other sort of a second area of learning about, um, you know, some of the issues youth face that are common is culture. How uh, do you relate to the language of your parents? How do you relate to um, the ways of parenting? The understanding of family structure. How are all these things that are culturally formed, how do they, how do you relate to multiple ways? You know, you live in New York and a family might parent one way, but your parents back home parent another way. How do you find your way through that cultural difference? And then the third area that is, is a common issue is how do you understand and live your faith and practice your faith uh, when the questions and the answers were formed in another context, another time, another place, and you're bringing it here and you're seeking to understand it. So these are some of the common questions that people face. We just want to show you some of the, introduce you some of the people, some of the stories. We're going to tell you a little bit more about these. This is a group of, uh, this is a, a member of a church, I think, from the Bronx, but he belongs to a group called God Belongs in My City which is a, a network of believers that was started in Brooklyn of youth ministers and young people to say, God actually belongs in my city. And it's a statement of their faith and they're finding their own identity. It's primarily Latino, but there's also African, African-American, and some others involved. These are some friends of ours from a church called Christ Apostolic uh, Church, Wosom, and it's a uh, group was founded in uh, Nigeria, and they are, uh, you, would, you would recognize in them a Pentecostal church, but in fact they have a much more history of a founded as a prophet-led church and um, sort of an African independent church. And they're in Queens, and they're, and they're really growing um, and planting multiple congregations throughout uh, the New York City area. Um, there are over 
by estimates over 500 Korean churches in New York City. This is one of the largest ones, uh, New York Presbyterian Church. Um, they renovated a old warehouse and it made it into a beautiful structure and it's a, a multi-generational Korean church um, in, in Queens. Um, this is one of the youth leaders uh, in that church. And this is a church, um, and I will not try the Spanish uh, because my son speaks Spanish whenever I try. I, I, um, I'm told I don't speak very well. But this is in English, the Last Harvest Church. And it's a storefront church in Queens. And that is one of the youth leaders. And the, that particular Sunday, she was preaching here in the church. So this gives you a sense of West Indian, uh, of Asian, of African, and Latino congregations, and, and just get a little sense of what it looks like and what it feels like to us in the city. We've noticed there's sort of different sets of questions. A lot of times in youth ministry, we think just about the youth. What are they thinking? What are they asking? But my own introduction to this whole field of, or field, this whole thinking more formally about um, youth ministry became, began with the parents. Um, I spent 10 years uh, uh, worshiping and being a part of African, African immigrant congregations in New York. And I was interested in things like prayer and the sermon and um, um, the things that things people shared together in their common life as a communities in New York and the vibrancy of that. And the parents took that for granted. The parents wanted to know what was going to happen to their kids. The question that was most on the minds of the parents was, what's going to happen to my kids? Will they stay in this church? Will they go to another church? Will they keep my culture, my language, my food, now that we've moved to New York? And um, will they even stay in the faith? That's a big question about in the West, will faith formed in the non-Western world, what happens when it encounters the West? Does it grow? Does it weaken? Does it adapt? Um, the churches are asking uh, a different set of questions. How are we coping with the change? Um, are young people staying? Are they going? What can I do to adapt? How can I keep everyone together? Um, and then the youth are asking, how is my faith going to help me understand my world and engage the world? What does my Christian faith mean for everyday life? And how am I going to express it? And what's my future? So different sets of questions, but they're all, they're all overlapping. Um, we've been looking at, uh, I, I think I went by it a little too fast, but in our research, um, we've been looking at about um, well, there's these number of congregations, and what we've done is we've narrowed it down to about 20 churches, but in reality is we're looking at probably 40 to 50 congregations, and are asking, what are the ways that they're, what are the, day, what are the ways that they are helping uh, the, uh, their congregants and their young people? Um, How is faith being transmitted? You know, what is the practice? What supports faith? What helps hold faith together? And so by looking at sort of this broad spectrum of churches, we've um, come up with a couple ways that we think that this happens in common. And the first way is that, um, is that young people are being formed in a, in a very strong, a living theological story. Whether it's Catholic or Protestant, um, Pentecostal, uh, people, young people participate in a story, whether it's a Eucharist or it's healing, they're participating in a living story and they can see it and touch it. It's not just cognitive but it's actually really alive and real to them. And so they are living in this living story. The second way, and, and uh, Janice is gonna talk about that uh, in uh, some uh, really important detail for us, is that congregations accompany young people on their journey. Um, this sense of belonging, who do I belong to? Um, who am I within the wider world? Uh, churches accompany young people, they're present to them. They, celebrate their birthdays, they help them on the way to college, they provide moral advice, and they're a community of belonging um, that's a stable place even as the world around them is changing. And then the third thing, and again I think Janice is going to give us a very um, uh, distinct and important picture of this, is that congregations provide places where people become leaders. They do things, you know, in, a, in, in most of our churches we have to do everything. So People learn to speak, they learn to pray, they learn to care for others, they learn to lead. And so some of the practices that we're observing in these churches, are our churches, are these stories. Now, <clears throat> we've also sort of, and um, are working with this as a possible paradigm of 
ways that congregations now then not just transmit faith, but how do young people relate to it long term? And uh, three models have sort of been striking uh, to um, us as we've thought about this. The first one is that congregations empower young people to go into the world. Um, coming to New York is a dream for most people. It may be really tough on the ground, but people from around the world want to come to New York City because they want to make a better life for their families. Um, that's the New York story for hundreds of years. New York City is a place of opportunity. America is a place of opportunity for people. It's seen, uh, New York City and America is seen as a place where, you know, I can improve life for my family, for myself, and for my family back home. You know, people come and they send, they work hard not just to support their family here, but to send money home. And so, uh, but they also want to empower young people to go out. And particularly in Pentecostal congregations, what we found is that some are not interested in retaining their members. Well, they're interested in retaining them, but they're more interested in them being equipped with their faith and going out into the world. They know they're not going to stay. So their vision from the start is, I'm going to equip you and empower you, pray for you, the Holy Spirit to empower you, and you're going to go out and you're going to be who you are called to be in the world. So there's an empowering aspect to young people. And I think every church has that, but some really let go of their youth in, in a way to trust the Lord with them through this empowerment. A second model is investing in the future of leadership. And we've seen this in a number of churches where congregations say, I, I really can see these young people are the future of our church. And they don't just pray for them to go to college, they help pay for them to go to college. And they create new positions for them as leaders in the church. And the third area is sort of incorporating youth into the congregation and parish life. And this is um, uh, especially in Catholic parishes, which are really thriving in, in the boroughs outside of Manhattan. Um, in these parishes, they create services in multiple languages. Um, they adapt uh, the liturgy. People are involved in things. So everyone becomes involved. And so there's an incorporation and multiple services to keep all the different families there. Um, Maria's Church has services in multiple languages. So just to give you just a sense, empowering. Um, these are young people. And, uh, these are kids at Redeemed Christian Church of God in Brooklyn. And this church, as I interviewed them over the years, they, the young people love their church, they love their faith, but God is sending them out into the world to create um, what they've been called to do. Um, this uh, area of investing in the future is a group called God Belongs in My City. It was begun in a Brooklyn storefront church, and now they're equipping young people across the city and, and youth ministers. And the third one is incorporating. Uh, just an example from St. Jerome's Church in the South Bronx. You can see in the Feast of Our Lady of Guadalupe, which is an important um, feast day for many congregations, um, that in this, there's young people involved in, in the pilgrimage, in the liturgy, in the community. So um, here's a question. What do you see? What do you see as the future of youth ministry in the city? What do you see ahead? What do you see, what is your picture of what can happen for youth in the city? Some of us were talking about that before the, before the session. What is our vision of what God can do? Just think about that for a second. As you're thinking about that, let me show you a picture of what it looks like when I see youth ministry in the city. You recognize that location? Where is that? That's Grand Central. Rick, can you tell what the shirts are those young people have? God belongs in my city. Remember that at the beginning I showed you that picture of that young man with God belongs in my city? There's 2,000 young people who are praying in Grand Central. Um, Grand Central is a hard place to get any attention. I've been there when the mayor and celebrities have been there and nobody even bats an eye. 2,000 young people walk in praying and they, and they get ready to kneel down and pray, and everybody stops. Even the Apple Store uh, customers pause to look. This is a network of young people and youth leaders from New York City who are expressing their faith and saying that God cares about the whole city, and everyone there cares about the teachers and the communities, and that is the future of much of what. So the next generation is leaving their mark in the city. This is the beginning of the prayer walk. Uh, this walk was across all Manhattan, and they began by taking chalk and drawing their feet, drawing around their feet and saying, we're leaving our mark on this city. Um, 
exciting time to be in the church in New York City. So I'm going to turn things over to Janice. Oh, now I'm going to, to Maria. So um, you've been very patient with us. I'm going to just give you directions, um, and I'll play a little clip, and then I'm going to give you a little bit of direction um, on how to interact with those papers on your tables. So if everybody can take a paper that has the circles, they're in the middle of your um, They look like this? Well, without the words? OK. OK, we're going to watch a quick clip, and then I'll explain. The Bible is full of genealogies, but no one ever pays attention to them. After all, who cares about a list of random names? Rehoboam beget Abijah, Abijah beget Asa, Asa beget Jehoshaphat. But there is purpose in those names. How can we hope to understand who we are unless we understand how we got here? That's the teaser, so you can watch the rest of it if you want to borrow it. Um, <laughs> so, coming back to the circles. Um, whenever we interact with anybody, um, and in particular with youth, we need to know who we are before we can engage with others. So um, we're going to invite you actually just to take some time to, and then we'll break, so you can do this during the break if you need to go and get some coffee or something. Um, there are three circles and in this, on this paper, and we're, we're inviting you to think about what's your viewfinder? How do you kind of perceive the world? Um, and it comes from your values, where you came from. So many of you may have inherited or were formed in your families, in your family or in community context. So I'm just invi we're inviting you now to just unpack a little bit um, in, on three different levels. Um, so in the central circle, you can um, write down a few words or phrases that you think um, characterize what are your personal or your core values. So for example, um, you could write faith in God or um, you can write um, what's a core personal value. I guess um, self-reflection, um, the importance of knowing myself, I would put down. So faith in God and self-reflection as a core thing that I think is important. And then in the, the circle, the middle circle, you can put down a family or a cultural value. Um, so something you learn from your parents that you feel like that's part, I mean, these are going to be positive or negative, or positive and negative um, words that kind of, you think that you've kind of inherited or has been part of your family upbringing. And then on the outside ring, um, societal values, which could be, in America, capitalism, consumerism, because um, we're all caught up in that. Um, but this is just a way to invite you to write down kind of what are all the things that are going in your own personal view of who you are and how you interact with others. Because as you fill that out, you realize that everyone else has this whole multiple layers of um, values and identities. And as you interact, you are sometimes having common and or contradicting um, value systems. And we have to, before we engage with others, understand where we're coming from. So um, had we more time, um, I would have asked you to spend a few minutes doing this for yourself, and then um, if you feel comfortable, kind of exchanging with someone at your table, a partner, someone who's sitting next to you, to kind of talk about maybe one slice. So one slice going through maybe one of the three layers, um, 
through the three layers to just kind of think about, you know, what this presentation so far is kind of drawing or bringing or resonating um, and bring out of what you're thinking about in terms of youth, family, context, and who you are and what you are doing in your context. So um, I'm going to invite you to go ahead and do that. And then if you feel comfortable, you can share with someone at your table. And I guess this can be the time also for the break. How long is the break? Um, so 10 minutes, is that okay? So yeah, so 10 minutes and you can do that amongst yourselves and then go take a break and then come back. All right, any questions? Okay. If you came in late, we have coffee setups, creamers, sugars, coffee cakes, waters, juices, right through that back door.
seems to be very fruitful and um, you can continue this during the next break and hopefully it's generating uh, multiple ideas um, that will be beneficial to you. again on um, the rest of our seminar. So we have today two brave and courageous volunteers who are going to share with us um, just a slice of their concentric circle. So um, Karina, Hi, I'm Kareen, um, and in the center of my circle, I have um, charity, because I think that's something that's really important to me, giving back to communities um, and our own community. And um, my family really values caring for others, and one thing my mom always says is, if not us, then who? So like, um, if we don't do it, who will? Mm -hmm. And then I've said society really values success, and that society's version of success is really different than what success is for me or what success is for my family. Okay, thank you. And we also have, and we also have Linda. Linda? Good morning, my name is Linda. Um, what I put for my middle circle the, the middle circle, I put some of the things I believe in is to really get to know myself. Um, I'm very fam family orientated, and you have to have perseverance, I believe that. In the second circle, I put that um, some of the, my family cultural values were just get up and be good to someone, do something good every day for someone if you can. And um, my outer circle, I put in this world today, one of the main things, you have to really have perseverance. Mm -hmm. You have to have a strong belief and be very goal-oriented into what you want to do. And also be, be a very good listener because by listening, you can understand where people are coming from. And I think that's where our greatest downfall is that we don't listen. We yeah. just sit and take pieces of what people say, but we're not really listening to what they really need in order to help them. Okay. Thank you. So as Maria shared before the break, the um, goal of this exercise was to help us begin to 
see ourselves, peel back, it's almost like an onion, peeling back the layers to identify um, what are the things that make me who I am. And the reality is, as we have this, these layers that um, shape us, the young people that we interact with on a weekly or daily basis, if they're your children, have those have a circle as well. They have this onion um, that they are interacting with and needing to learn um, to reflect on as well. So first I should say thank you again to Skip and um, to Yale for having us here for this um, event. Um, by way of introduction um, to get us into um, the third part of the talk, um, I was born in rural Jamaica, and I take pleasure in saying I was born. I'm not from Kingston, I'm not from Montego Bay, I'm not from Ocho Rios. I'm from the part of Jamaica that you call, I guess it would be called Little England. It is the cooler climes of Manchester. Um, and so my, if, if I did this concentric circle exercise, my formative years in Jamaica with my father's mother, um, who raised me and my sister, would play a prominent role in how I've come to know myself. And another piece of, um, that has helped me in the past years to know myself is to study um, West Indian congregations. So what I'm going to share with you comes out of um, a five-year period where I was in a um, Jamaican Pentecostal church in the Bronx, having just come from seminary, looking at the things around me and asking questions about what will be the future of the youth in this church? Um, what is the interaction between Jamaican culture, which for me at times seems like the, the laws of Medes and Persia that changeth not, and um, the gospel and being mission-minded. So all of, um, I, I was in a process of grappling with these questions, seeking to understand, Lord, you've equipped me with this seminary education. How do I now live this out in a practical way in this community that I'm a part of? So that whole process sent me back to seminary and to further research. Um, into West Indian um, Pentecostals and their work among young people. So I'm going to share with you part of my um, ongoing research about West Indian um, Pentecostal churches and their work with um, young people, specifically in Brooklyn. So the neighborhood that we are going to look at, as Mark says, location, 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 uh, context, um, plays a part. So the neighborhood that this church is located is in Brownsville, um, New York. And so these are just a couple of statistics about Brownsville. You have single and two parent families. Um, in terms of neighborhoods in the city, it probably has the largest concentration of NYCHA housing. Um, so that will impact the, you'd say, the wider ethos of the neighborhood. Median income in 2011 was 31,000. So you have a, this, this mixture of schools where you have high truancy rates, low test scores, but you also have schools like Eagle Academy and others where the, the kids are flourishing and blooming. So with every, as one of my professors said, there's always two sides to the tree. So there's the positive um, that we encounter in every neighborhood, and there's also the negative as well. So in terms of the young people, you have some gang activity, but you also have social community organizations that are providing creative spaces for them to grow and thrive. And one of those major community organizations is the immigrant church. So let me tell you a little bit about Ladder Rain Ministries. So this church was started out of a series of prayer meetings. And I know it might be the case for other immigrant churches, but I know for specifically for Jamaican West Indian immigrant churches, 
You talk to the people who were there when the church got started and they tell you, we met together for prayer and this is what it came out of. So there is this strong foundation of we will only do this ministry and we will only exist in this ministry if we are making space for the spirit of God to infuse all that we do. So while I was at that church for those five years, I remember we lived in Rockland County. We drove 45 minutes to church, four or five days a week, depending on what the event was. And one of those days was six o'clock prayer on a Saturday morning. And so that was woven into the very fabric of the church. So it was started by eight people, the, the bishop, and eight others. And the unique thing about this, um, this particular church, which you don't normally see with other Jamaican churches, is that initially it started as a branch. It was the New York branch of a small Jamaican denomination. And then by the 1980s, it had grown to the extent that it separated itself and became its own ministry, and then became the headquarters of branches that it went back to Jamaica and planted, planted some in Canada and in other places in the US. So in terms of the church and its role in West Indian community, this is a place you go and you sing the choruses you used to sing back home. This is the place you're eating, be it jerk chicken, curry goat. Um, I remember going to functions and while you're in church announcing the function, one of the things that had to be said listen, at this function, we will have our own food. So you, you're eating curry goat, the same things that you would eat at home. And so this is a place where who you are is celebrated. Who you are, it, it's valued, it's affirmed. It's, it becomes this community. This, it, you know, you, sometimes you have people come and they're by themselves, this becomes your family. The, the ones, the older ones become your mothers, the, the ones your age become your sisters, the younger ones become your brothers. So what are the, who are the um, West Indian American youth that we're going to be talking about today? They are 1.5, that means they came to the U.S. either before their teenage years. So I'm a 1.5-er. The second generation are those who were born here in the U.S. of immigrant parents. So many live in the surrounding neighborhoods. So many of the ones we're going to meet today live in Brownsville with all those dynamics. They come from both two parents and single family households. And many have grown up in this particular church. So what are some of the ways in which this church creates this fostering um, of faith, sticky faith, faith that lasts, transmission of faith among their young people. So I'm going to talk about three, and this is the first one, community and belonging. So for them, you will have some say, I was born in the church. They weren't literally born in the church, but by the time they're probably three months old, they have been in the church. So this is a place from very early you are taught that you belong here. You are wanted here. You are needed here. So even in the Sunday school, the, the youth ministry, the young people are invited into the story of faith. They're invited into the story of the church. They're invited into faith in Christ. So you might be in your Sunday school with your Sunday school teacher and as she's narrating to you the scriptures, they're also saying to you, live for Christ. They're narrating these stories. And for those who come in their teenage years, depending on, you know, if you come around 15, you might come with an accent. And you go to our inner city school, as they say, fresh off the plane. You know, by the time, if you come in July, by the time September rolls around, the nostalgia of being in America has began to wear off and your parents who you know have brought you here for a better life send you into the local public school you don't know anybody you have no friends 
and you're trying to just figure your way how to get from this class to that class and not even get there late. And so you face a context, especially if you're coming from a place and you're coming with a very thick, heavy accent. Sometimes they say, just put a sign on your back and say, kick me or ridicule me or because it is so blatant. So you're having some of these young people enter into school or enter into these communities with an accent that marks them as a stranger. And you also have some, um, if you're, I guess, within the black community, and if you are going to school and you're on the honor roll and the teacher calls on you and say you're an excellent student, inevitably you're gonna get into the place where you're the Oreo, you act white, you know, you're black on the outside, but you're white in the middle. And so, that itself puts, it sets you up for either being jumped or ridiculed or ostracized. You just don't belong. And so the other area that you end up, can end up in trouble as well, is that you don't hang with the people on the street. Because if you're coming from a traditional West Indian family, you're not going to hang with the people on the street. Certain time come when school is over, you find yourself home. And so for the young people who find themselves dealing with these things on a day-to-day -day basis, the church provides them with the spiritual framework in which to interpret these experiences. So I didn't experience it, but my sister did. Going to school and being ridiculed for your accent. But when you go to church on a Friday night for youth group, and you go to church on a Sunday morning for church, you're hearing Patwa left, right, and center. You're hearing God has equipped you. You are God's child. You are the head and not the tail. You shall be above and not beneath. This becomes this rhetoric that charges you up and fuels you up and sends you back out into that week to say, okay, Lord, we can do this. So this is what... This is what the church comes along and becomes this place of community and belonging for the young people. It's also, for many of them, the place of primary friendships. So you, this is a quote from one of the young ladies. She says, if you don't come to church, you feel left out. Your whole Sunday is messed up. Mm -hmm. And like being here for so long, you get to know people. You get to know the environment, and it's part of one big family. If you miss, if you miss somebody for one or two Sundays, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a tendency to call them. Or if there's something going on, you call them, and like, I'm having a barbecue, come over. So this is your family. You, your, your, your family grows exponentially to include the church as well. So in, to foster this community and belong it, it affirms West Indian culture and value, and it functions as this home away from home. Home away from home for the parents, home away from home for the young people. Here's another quote um, from a young lady. She says, when I look around, the people I've known for 20 plus years, majority has come from this church. So these people I grew up with, these people I spent numerous hours with, from sleepovers as young children to birthday parties, to adults sharing in their wedding and stuff like that. So it's a community you know, and most of us would say it was an alternative, a safe haven for our parents versus having you play with people from public school or playing with kids on the block or whatever. You made your community, your family, and your church. So it becomes this central place in the lives of our young people. Another way that it fosters this transmission of faith is that it gives you access to adults who are for you. You know, when you look at the statistics, it says that when you grew up in a female-headed household, the, the likelihood of you dropping out of school is high. The likelihood of you getting involved in um, gangs or other criminal activity is high. So if you have young people who are coming from that context, you are getting access to people who are nurses, teachers, some are home health aid people, but they are for you. They want to see you grow. They want to see you thrive. They want to see you succeed. 
So you are surrounded with adults who love you and love you in multiple ways. They're coming alongside you to provide emotional, financial, and spiritual support. So you might have a student who, because of the home situation, they don't have money to pay, buy lunch during the week. Guess who is coming alongside them? You have other families in the church who are saying, we want, we're investing in you. And if, it, if that investment means $20 a week, it is $20 a week because we are for your good. And so this young man, this is what he says. One young man called an older woman in the church mother, not out of disrespect. It's not because they're old, but just the fact that they've proven to be a mother to me, even sister. I call her mom. When everyone hear me call her mom, they're like, she's not old enough to be your mom, but she's always been like a mother to me from since I was a child, since I was like six years old. She's always been a mother to me. So you find mothers and fathers and aunts and uncles, all of that, those familial relationships. So even as you have access to these adults, one of the things that these relationships are doing, they are reinforcing what the youth receive from their parents, grandparents, guardians, from what they receive at home is being reinforced at church. And that might include discipline. So you have this quote here in Jamaica, they have this um, phrase about the steer. The parent doesn't have to say anything if a child is cutting up or misbehaving, I, I have a seven-month-old, so I pray to God that I get this there. And you just look at the child, and the child knows once they, you say, the two and two make four? Yes, it is time to put the hands down and start whatever I'm doing. So this young man says, growing up here, people who aren't your parents can give you the look that rips me up inside. And your father, he looked at me one Sunday and I wanted to cry. He didn't have to say a word. So you, there are times you don't have to say a word. The look says it all. So the final thing I'm going to share with you today is how are the churches coming alongside the youth in very practical ways to cultivate life skills? So first, they affirm and celebrate the work of the Holy Spirit. They will tell these young people from early on, the Holy Spirit is not bound by age or sex or race. So you can be a young person, you say charging and raging and just wanting to go from the Lord for the Lord and they will, they will give you, you say the, the platform, the bill of rights. You know, they affirm that, they make space for you. Second, they model what this interaction between ministry and the equipping of the Holy Spirit looks like. So if they see, you know, say a Sunday school teacher sees this young person who's coming to church and just so passionate about the word of God, wanting to say, God, how do I live this out in my life? They will begin to come alongside this young person, call them during the week. How are you doing? Pray for you. I support you. Model, they will, I guess in the youth group would say, frame it in terms of calling and be with them as they discern. What, what is your calling? How is God calling you to participate in the life of the church? And that leads to three, create space for youth to be involved and take leadership in various aspects of the congregational life. So what are some of the things that they're doing? They're assisting in leading youth group, leading the youth ministry, the music ministry. Um, this particular church, I found it very interesting that one of the major musicians on a Sunday morning was a 13-year-old piano player. And think about, for him as a young man in a Brownsville neighborhood, with whatever the statistic says about him, being in church, and he knows on a Sunday morning, I am helping to usher in the people in this congregation into the very presence of the Lord. This is what my calling is, and this is how God has empowered me. They, um, they, they, they're involved in ushering the youth choir, Sunday school presentations, 
organizing and participating in youth services, and also representing the church in other youth functions as they in the neighborhood or throughout the city. So what are the things that these um, participating in these events does? So some of the skills that they begin to glean very early, and sometimes in a church you're having your Christmas program or your Easter program, and the, the two-year-old or three-year-old who can, you know, the knees shaking, they're in the white dress or suit with bow tie and they have their little card and they're reading, they are learning public speaking from very early. They're learning responsibility, leadership. When you have been given charge to lead a youth service, there's certain skills you will, you will learn over that period of time. You will learn to manage skills. You will learn how to approach somebody so that together you work collaboratively to make sure that this program is a success. You're learning intergenerational communication. And you're also learning how to present yourself in public. So you have these two quotes um, from two young men. So one has been in this church most of his life, has gone through um, the, this level of preparation and cultivation of life skills, no works in um, corporate America. And this is what he says. So a lot of things are gauged by how a person is perceived or how others interact with them. This church helped me with that as far as how to present myself. And then this young man, um, the evangelist was his mentor and he came to him, he would you know, walk him through the process of um, moderating and leading youth services and he comes to him one day and say, okay, in two weeks time, you're, gonna, you're, you're in charge of the youth service. And this man, this young man goes into this all out panic. So this is what he says. Evangelist said, you're doing the entire service. And he says, so you have to think of, think of a topic. People who will participate, oh gosh, that was the hardest thing to do, but it was a stepping stone. I was able to do it, thank God. It pushed me out there. It made me know how to present myself on that level. So you are learning at the youth group level, youth services, Sunday school presentation, how do you present yourself in public? So I'm gonna turn um, it over to Mark and he's gonna help us make sense of all that we have heard so far. Thank you, Janice. And um, I think you know Janice can also preach. <laughs> um, let me just give a couple summary points and then uh, just a couple things that I've been hearing um, that we've been saying together as we, as we think about the, the way that Maria, Janice, and I have shared. <clears throat> the first one is just to summarize that what we're trying to say is that the city, in particular a global city like New York, but cities around the world and even, even here in New Haven, really around the world, increasingly cities are places of connection where people are moving back and forth. And as people move and as they come to new cities and um, as people migrate, um, the church is going with it. And so there is, as we hear about migration and change in the world, it's also about faith and religion. And in New York City, we're, we're Understanding that, that Christian faith has moved in the city, is moving around the city in ways that are very surprising. And that is producing, through the diverse cultures and places that people come from, a diverse spectrum of uh, churches and youth ministries. It's really an extraordinary story about what is happening on the ground when we're able to actually see it and, and listen to it. I think the second thing we're saying is that for youth ministry, for the practice of youth ministry, that and our observations of New York, and also our own stories, that the church is really matters, that the church really is a central factor. It's not irrelevant to young people in the city. Um, churches do this in different ways. There's many different ways that churches practice this formation. We mentioned that um, people are um, formed in a living story. Well, for that living story to be formed in you, sometimes it may be, if you're in a Catholic parish, it may be the Eucharist, which is one of the main ways. Or it may be in a Pentecostal church, it may be seeing people be healed. Or reading scripture, as Maria shared, the scripture shaped her life. These are all not necessarily not 
You know, they're not mutually, um, I mean, they can overlap together. But churches matter to faith and to the transmission of faith and to how things change. And then the third thing about the city is that we're saying that our stories really matter. Our individual stories really matter. How we, how we um, the beginnings of every institution and, and churches at the heart of this, the beginnings matter. And we're part of stories. And a, 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 a Christian story, um, we're part of family stories, and we're part of congregational stories. And as part of these stories, we, our identity is formed and who we are and how we engage the world and how we understand God and how we understand ourselves and one another. But I think just as our stories matter, we need to hear each other's stories. That the more we can listen to one another, the more we can learn. Something I learned about youth ministry from the earliest days is that, you know, um, the city's always changing, um, the, the culture's changing, the world is changing, and so we want to do a, a combination of, of action, you know, doing youth ministry on the ground, but also reflecting about what we're learning from what we're hearing from young people. As I raise, help raise two young sons, um, we're thinking about what is happening, and you're reflecting on that, and you're learning constantly. And one of the great blessings that we have to work as a team and as a seminary is that we're learning from one another, and we're learning from the stories around the tables that we have in our community that are from, that represent people from around the world and from across the city. So our stories matter, and the stories that we can tell one another really matter, and we can learn from that, and that gives us great opportunity to grow. So there's just a couple summary points from what we've been sharing. So for our final um, response from you, um, we're gonna invite you to take the paper that you were using before with the circles and flip it over, um, unless you have a notebook and you'd rather use that. And we'd like to, to think about what brought you here today. And just take a minute to just write down your thoughts um, about what resonated for you from what we shared and where you are presently in your ministry context. Um, and then we'll give you the next <coughs> instruction. So just take a minute to process a little bit and write down um, what you're thinking. Okay, so put your pencils down, or pens down. <laughs> um, so now we're going to invite you to split, depending on how many people are at in, in your table, so groups of three or four, um, and you or may have, or three and two, it might be easier if it's, well. Um, if you see on this slide, this is a tableau, or a frozen image, and the exercise for this group was to um, envision what does leadership look like. So this group of three people, discussed, and this is the um, expression that they gave to leadership. So um, rather than that, leadership, we are going to ask you to, in your small groups, share about your major takeaways and to decide on a tableau or a frozen action or image that represents your group's cumulative takeaway. So it could either be individuals doing your personal takeaways being in a group, if you choose, or deciding as a group 
maybe one action that really epitomizes everything. So you can choose. Um, and so we're going to give you about 10 minutes to have conversations and decide on that. And then we're going to invite um, two or three groups to come up here to do their tableaus. And then we'll unpack a little bit. So you have about 10 minutes, and we'll come around and see who's brave enough to come up and um, do their tableau for the group. So that will be a way for us to kind of do a little, a little um, stretching. <laughs> stretching and breaking and um, also thinking about what's been going on this morning. Are there any questions? Okay, go.
Yeah, so we need to go talk. I, let me go talk to the one. Yeah, yeah I already spoke to them. And we talked to this one? I haven't spoken. I, I spoke to them across the table, but. Okay. All right, so two minutes around. Okay, we're going to give you two more minutes, but it looks like there are three groups that have been getting up out of their seat and practicing, two in separate rooms. So I think they will be our selected groups. Okay, looks like we have four volunteer groups, and uh, we're going to invite this other group to come back to their table. So, this is what we're going to do. We're going to invite one group at a time to come up to this space. Um, and we're going to count down from five, four, three, two, one, freeze, and they'll freeze into their action. Then we're going to invite people who are not in the tableau to shout out what they see or what they think the present that they're presenting. Um, and then the group will unfreeze, and then a representative from the group will share if the perception of their intention was the same or it was something different, just to kind of unpack what people's take uh, takeaways have been from today. Okay, so first group volunteer. We'll start with this group. All right. Oh, sorry. Oh, you guys are so eager. <laughs> You're all standing up. Okay, we'll start with this side of the room. Okay, so we have this group, and um, I think the camera's over there, so you might want to face there. But I will count you down from five. Are, are you ready? Are you ready? Okay, and just be aware that the camera's over there, so they make one up. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to count down from five to one, and then you'll freeze, and then we'll take some observe observations. Okay, five, four, three, two, one, freeze. Okay. Okay, so from the um, rest of the tables, any observations? What do you think they're doing? What was their takeaway? Oh, sorry, the, the microphone's going to come to you. I think they might be laying on hands and they're mm -hmm. praying to a sovereign and a holy God. Okay. Um, they're supporting each other so that their mm -hmm. life would be uh, directed to God. Hmm. Okay, great. Any other observations or thoughts? Insights, profound wisdom. Okay, over here. It looks like to me that they're unified and they're pointing 
whoever or whatever to, to, to Christ or to God. Okay, great. Okay, I'm going to invite you to unfreeze, and if a representative from your group would like to share a little bit about your tableau. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, when we were together, we started to think about, Jane came up with, from today's lesson, belonging, belonging to something. And then we came up with unity, and we came up with togetherness, and I came up with the bonding piece. So what our tableau was, touching is the unity, the bonding, and then our pointing was a place of going somewhere, whether it's reaching Christ or heaven or wherever it was, but there was a goal of all of us together, belonging, unity, bonding, getting someplace together, and being supportive completely. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, so second group, that was so excited. Come on up. This is going to be interesting. Maybe we need more room for you. <laughs> we have a um, men's group over here. <laughs> Okay, so just remember the cameras over there. So if you if you have a forward or front to your thing, okay, five, four, three, two, one, freeze. Wow, and you're gonna have to hold that. Okay, observations, insights, comments. Uh, I see uh, prayer, unity, support and leadership to new heights or to Christ. All right. Okay, any other thoughts? Um, I see a foundation in uplifting. Many people coming together uh, to help one. Okay. <laughs> okay, one last comment before he falls. Out. I see mentorship. Amen. All right, unfreeze. <laughs> okay, so uh, representative from your group, want to unpack for us a little bit what your intentions were? Okay, um, well, today what we saw through the stories, you see uh, a diversity of cultures, but in it you see unity. The unity. Uh, that God creates, you know, and uh, that's what we represent. We're representing like different cultures, but there's unity in that, in that. And at the same time, we are on our knees because we're depending on God. He has to lead the way. But in the same time, we uplift the youngest one, the future, to go to new heights and to step into the call of God for his life. Amen. Thank you. Okay, we had a third group. Okay, over here, hand raised. Come on up. While they're coming forward, I want to do a product placement. These are the men from Pivot House Ministries. They and 20 of their brothers will be here to sing for us at the Fearless Dialogues event. It's not too late to RSVP, Thursday night, 6.30. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, come on up. Okay, another all-men group. <laughs> okay, I'm going to count down. Five, four, three, two, one, freeze. Oh, still freezing. Oh, my gosh. Okay, quick comments, observations, quickly. Foundation. Foundation. Standing on the shoulders of those who went before. Any other comments? Strong backs. Strong backs. All right. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Any other, anything else? Balance. Balance. Well, that is important, isn't it? Christ is a solid rock. Okay, unfreeze. Thank you. Okay, someone unpack for us, please. How leadership, 
um, is, isn't always from the top down, but the best leadership is from the bottom up. Um, and how leadership is supposed to be, tho those who are leaders are those who allow people to, uh, who, who, who use their gifts and their talents in themselves to, to push people to higher heights. And so um, that's what we should be doing in youth ministry, right, um, at, with our youth. Um, they should be able to stand on our shoulders, whether figuratively or literally, and, uh, and reach higher heights, so. Okay, amen. I think there was one more group. Yes, come on up. Yes, you. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to count down. I'll let you get settled first. All right. Okay. Five, four, three, two, one, freeze. Comments? Reaching out. Reaching out? Anyone else? Sorry. Oh. Leaning and depending. Hmm. Anyone else? Inviting and connecting. I think I heard touching. They're touching. Okay. Okay, last comment so they can unfreeze. Praying and delegating. Say that again? Delegating. Delegating. Delegate. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. Unfreeze. Uh, representative to share. Uh, I think the mic is coming. Hello. Um, we, we talked about um, how sometimes there's a, get, a disconnect between different cultures, and so we had two people here representing either different cultures or dinner, uh, different generations, and then mm -hmm. we had ourselves being the teachers, um, kind of trying to bridge that gap and mm -hmm bring them together and um, so we talked about responsibility, how that is the responsibility of teachers and um, youth ministers and how we're trying to pass that responsibility on to our, to our students or congregations. Great, thank you very much. <laughs> so thank you very much for accommodating and being brave to come to the front. Um, I'm gonna invite Mark and Janice back up and I guess we'll have a little bit of time for any final questions. I, we've let you talk amongst yourselves, but if you have any questions for us, we're happy to oblige. Does anybody have any questions for our presenters today? Um, I wanted to know, I, I kind of have two questions. Um, at my local church, and I'm from Brownsville, Brooklyn, so I know what you was talking about. Our congregation is, not predominantly, it is African, it's black. However, over the past 10 years, we have welcomed into our congregation those from other African descents. And what I found is that some of the people who are American are not, they, they, they treat them as if they're something other than, how do, than, than black. Oh, you know, it's like they're just a total foreigner whether they're American born or whether they're foreign born because of their roots. I've had some call people from the West Indies Africans, why are you doing that? How do we, how do I, besides just going saying, you know, find out who they are and, and, and don't call them outside of what they are and that shouldn't matter. What, how do we 
bring a more welcoming environment to others from other cultures because we want to do diversify because our neighborhood also um, Caucasian people are moving in everywhere and you want to be a welcoming church and how do we do that my next question is I'm the international youth ministry minister and we reach out to um, different countries and we have churches in different countries and now some of them are they come to our international but the youth are going to come together how do i create a climate where those youth that are from the other countries are comfortable when they come how how do i create a more accepting environment what do i do to make people <laughs> <laughs> what do i do to help the youth to welcome them in a real way not fake all right, so I'll start with the first question. Um, what has worked for me when I am interacting with, say, African Americans, and there's tension at times between African Americans and West Indians, is relationships. You have a story, though they, they are African Americans in your church have a deep history of faith, and the ones coming from the West Indies and other places also have a deep history of faith. So the question is, how can you, it may be having like a, a dinner or some social time that it's, it's, it, it allows you to relax yourself. It's not as structured. And you begin to have people sit together and share their stories. Nothing, I, I would say in many ways, nothing, and we've seen this at City Seminary, when you create a context where people are sharing themselves, eating together, those walls come down um, without you having to intentionally say, this wall must come down. Mm -hmm. um, if my friend is African American, that begins to change how I, how I interact with African Americans. If I know someone who's a good friend and I value their story, who's West Indian, that is going to soften my heart in, in regards to the wider West Indian population. I think um, some other ideas, I mean, even the concentric circle um, exercise, I think not being afraid of hard conversations, because kids can tell the difference between sugarcoating and being real. So having really authentic conversations and saying, and naming the, what, the elephant, you know, this stuff is happening. What are you going to do about it? and putting it on them and having them take some time to maybe do the circle and say, you know, I never really thought about it now that I hear somebody else's slice. I thought I was like this, and then they make the connections. I think another thing is, um, I've been doing work with diversity is, I'm not gonna go into the whole theoretical stuff, but um, doing things that don't just require talking and writing, because our, you know, academic school system is read and write and read and write and read and write, but we're people that interact in different ways, which is why we asked you to do the tableau, to embody and to use your whole body and to do things that maybe, you know, I'm so used to reading and writing and, and we're just supposed to talk about this all the time. Sometimes you have to do something together. Sometimes it's about seeing a movie, watching a movie or making a piece of art or music or poetry or what's called presentational ways of knowing, experiencing things together that create that common bridge where then you can unpack together. So I guess the two things is not being afraid of addressing what's there and having conversations and saying like, look, we're gonna have these conversations and we're gonna create a safe space where everybody's allowed to talk, but you're not allowed to disrespect the other person. You gotta listen. And setting those ground rules and then inviting them into that conversation of saying, look, you know, this stuff is happening, why do you think it's happening? And then kind of unpacking. So saying like, you know what, maybe once a month we're gonna have these conversations and we're gonna just tackle it. And it may not feel so comfortable, but we're not here about to being all happy, happy, joy, joy. It's about how do we really understand and get each other so that we can understand that the church brings together people who don't necessarily become friends naturally. Um, and then, I mean, what I've, experience in my research on diversity is like when you do something together, like you have some kind of intense experience, the conversations that happen after are amazing. You don't even like, you, you can't create that. So it's like creating an experience, going on a trip, watching a movie, or something that, you know, makes people, you know, let their guard down a little bit, like she was saying, 
maybe it's in the, in, in the informal spaces, but also in some kind of created experience where they can then have a conversation after. But it's having had that common bond. So it might be saying, OK, you know what? We're going to do a PBB of our neighborhood. We're going to find out what's going on in our neighborhood. We're going to pray, but we're going to go talk to people. And then having this joint purpose of saying, let's go find out what's happening in our neighborhood and how we can pray for it together. And then they start asking questions, and they start learning about things they didn't know about their neighborhood. They assumed. And then they're saying, oh, now I know why these people are coming into our neighborhood. Or now I know this is what their experience is. And then they're jointly praying for and trying to understand now what are, what's going on in our neighborhood and how can we pray together, because that's what we have in common. So, I, I would say one of the things we have noted, um, like at City Seminary, the cohorts of students are very diverse. And um, one of the, the primary things we share off the bat is that everybody brings something to the table. So the students, but also the faculty who are facilitating the conversations, we all come to the table as students. We're, we come as learners. We're learning together. So it doesn't matter if you have 10, 15 years of theological education, or you have none, by virtue of your faith and what you have, how you've grown up in the Lord, you have something to contribute to the conversation. So in regards to the international youth coming from all of these places, it's setting that framework from the beginning that everyone, this story will only reach its fullest heights when everybody participates. Question in the back? Oh, that's okay. Oh. Okay. Well, this message is for Janice. Is that yes. um, your study on West Indians, is this predominantly Afro-Caribbeans, or are you, um, is the study also with Latino-based West Indians, like Puerto Ricans, Dominicans, and Cubans? It's Afro-Caribbean. OK. Yeah. And I ask that because um, my, I'm Puerto Rican. My husband's Afro-Caribbean, and he come, his, he's a PK father, okay. has, a, has a church, has, he's a pastor. And our culture is very similar, but there's a lot of difference. Mm -hmm. And as um, our sister shared, there's a lot of like, you know, conflict at times. But have you seen specifically in Brooklyn, being as our sister said, like the hub for many cultures and churches, have you seen more um, churches working together, specifically, specifically the Afro-Caribbean churches with the Latino churches? Is that seeing, are we seeing that? Or is, is there still that huge divide? Um, the ones that I've done research on in Brooklyn their networks are primarily still Afro-Caribbean. Um, it would be interesting to continue the research to see that as the, the young people um, grow up and take on leadership in the congregations, will they begin to widen the networks? So that may be uh, developing um, something that continues later on. We have a question back here, Professor. I want to say very generous of you to continue past our time. Those who are feeling, where's my lunch? It's here. We'll continue, we'll continue the questions and answers, but if you'd like to slip back through to the food service, you can begin while we do the question and answer. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Roman Barksdale. Um, as I'm looking at the presentation, I was rather touched because I am from New York. I've lived in every borough that was presented there. So um, I, I, I have a lot of identification. When we talk about Brooklyn, uh, when I lived in Brooklyn, we had the, 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 um, the Haitians, the Jamaicans, the Africans, the blacks, very few Latinos. But the unity that was there when it came, when you walk down the street, Rather, they were um, Christian, Seventh-day Adventists, Jehovah Witnesses. You had a sense that God was there. Mm -hmm. And they were very strong with the unity or, or the unification of the children out in Brooklyn. And I've experienced that while living in Brooklyn more so than any other borough. Um, I don't really have a question. I have a statement mm -hmm. that um, I feel safe to speak for the majority here that your presentation was very well put together. And I hope everyone is here tomorrow because when my guys come to sing, we're gonna, <laughs> we're gonna lift up Pivot Ministries.
Just um, excuse the ignorance underlying this question, but it just comes to me. From Jamaica, obviously uh -huh. you're the, Rasta, the Rastas. I'm curious how your ministry and church does or does not include them. Okay. So, so for, I, I, I guess I'll just give a brief summary of Rastafarianism. So Rastafarianism um, emerged in Jamaica in the early 1900s, probably around 1930s, um, as a means of critiquing um, the interaction between, you'd say, Christianity at the time and um, the blacks, the majority of the, the people in the Caribbean. And so it was a way of answering, um, you'd say, cultural dissonance, um, finding a place of speaking to um, affirming their blackness and the personhood as black people. So it came out of, so it, in, in many ways, Rastafarianism is a critique of um, Christianity, but also of the social, con social context. Hmm? To some extent, because they, they use, they use the, the Old Testament features very much into Rastafarianism. But if you talk to the typical Christian Jamaican, Rast the Rastas are not Christian. They don't believe in Christ. They believe that Haile Selassie is the reincarnation of Christ. So um, for the churches here, um, they would hold to that same um, dichotomy. It's Rasta is, you know, we love Bob Marley. We celebrate Bob Marley. He made good music. Um, but when it comes to the religious aspect, the line is drawn there. Um, I should say, though, that, for example, in the London context, which is also an area that I did some research, the young people in London, when they were dealing with um, racism um, in that context, used Rastafarianism as a means of speaking into their, um, their process as black youth in a, in a context that does not welcome them. So there are ways, I, I'm, I guess I'm saying, there are different points of engagement with Rastafarianism. You can engage it from the social consciousness um, aspect. Some people engage it from the religious aspect, and others see it as a vehicle of speaking into their personhood um, when they're in certain social situations. I just have a challenge for, um, you have inspired uh, me in so many ways, everything that you have brought today. Um, but I have a challenge for those who organize this event because, for example, we, I have a, a Latin um, church, and even though we speak, and I quote unquote, Spanish, um, I have this member that she says, oh, I'm, I am bilingual. I speak uh, Puerto Rican, I speak Mexican, I speak, because in a way we, even though we speak Spanish, we have so many barriers mm -hmm. of cultures that don't let us coincide. And, and sometimes it doesn't, we don't have to even be like with African Americans or Caucasians or, or from any other nations to be in, not connected. We, we are just Latin and we are not connected. Um, that would be an awesome thing to do in the future. Um, so if you, you know, have that in, keep that in mind. <laughs> I, am, I am from uh, Ethiopian and uh, Eritrean community church in New Haven. I'm the pastor for that church. And I'm really impressed by your presentations. And I'm happy to hear that Mary also was in Ethiopia, too. Yes. <laughs> uh, uh, my question is, you know, the challenge we have, you already mentioned it. And our children who are born here in America, mm -hmm. they do not like everything we have in our church. Mm -hmm. Everything that means they, they, ha they like our food, music. But we have still problem to communicate them 
with the gospel, with the way that they like it. So sometimes they don't come to our church. They prefer to go to, uh, uh, to you know, the place that they, they think it's good for them. And there is always a tension between, you know, parents and their children uh, when they come to the church, you know, uh, to the uh, immigrant church. So uh, what can we do uh, to help them to come together with the family and worship God? Uh, and how you can build a bridge between these gap? Thank you. I think in the, in the Chinese church, um, there have been different uh, ways of going about it. We have the Chinese service and the English service. So it could be a language and cultural kind of, um, well, the English service provides the second generation a way to sing the songs that maybe that are there, that resonate with them, um, and that they can have leadership in that level. Um, I think that, I mean, there is that tension there, even I think from a leadership level, um, I think from I, the, I guess the parent generation and the younger generation, you know, even if the younger generation grows up, there is the tension of making decisions for the English side. Um, but I think just being able to have conversations around it, like I was saying before, it's like if you ignore what's there, and you just keep going and saying, this is right, this is right, we have to do it this way, then there is no way to bridge. Um, maybe also having conversations with other immigrant churches in your area, geographic area, um, and ask them, you know, what are you doing with your youth? Um, is there a way that maybe we can have a mixture of our youth who would like to do some things in English, but then have, you know, so that it's not a both, it, it's not an either or, but you can create a kind of a both and. So there are times when they can worship with the parents, but then there are times where they can be comfortable in maybe doing things that are more English and more Western. So not creating that, that schism that says it has to be this way or it has to be that way. Um, I think then you just kind of, stop the conversation altogether. But if you say, hey, you know, we realize that you are in a totally different context, and, um, well, in the OCM context, I mean, they brought in a, 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 a white guy. Um, I, and I mean, I, I'm not saying that that applies to every, every church context. Um, but even now in this generation, there are people of my age who are, <clears throat> who grew up, and they are going back as the English pastor, because they, I, I don't know how, how many generations your church is. If you have um, people who have now grown up here and then are coming back to the church to work with that population. So it might be a timeline thing that at first, you know, it's opening the conversation, realizing that there needs to be space for both types of worship or, you know, and appreciate that and not say this is wrong or this is right. But then as time goes by, there will be people who come back then to serve who are from, who grew up in that church, but are be able to, who are bridge builders, who have both that Western perspective and also the cultural heritage and understanding of the home culture, that they can then be kind of the, the youth leaders and the pastors. So I'm thinking this is more almost a, a longitudinal answer to your question. So the short term would be, you know, opening up the conversation and maybe providing space for multiple things to happen rather than either or. And the second thing is to continue to invest and, and say like, you know what, we understand that you would like to worship this way, and we, but we also are holding on to this is, you know, who we are, this is our faith that we, this is how you've been formed, but then there will be like the different people who either move on or come back. All right. We want to thank the panel um, for all their wisdom and their knowledge. Let's give God a great hand of praise for them. Thank you. Uh, for the rest of us, I'm going to ask you just to stand to your feet, and we're going to pray and give grace. And, of course, our time is up. But if you do have any questions, you can um, uh, feel them at a, at, a, at a personal level, and, and I'm sure that all of the panel will be open to that as well. Uh, and so let us pray. <clears throat>